Deirdre, we can't think about consciousness, we can't think about certainly sleep without looking at the nature of dreams. And dreams has a long human history to try to understand what it means. So help me through this history, the, the history of dreams. How can we begin to understand the total scope of dreams in this uh, journey of mankind that we're all taking? Well, dreams seem to go back about as far as recorded human history does. Uh, a lot of anthropologists have speculated that some of the more surreal elements in cave paintings, they're people with antlers mm -hmm. and, you know, people with wings in, in some of those, that, that those may be depicting a dream. You know, who knows? That's, that's speculative. And certainly some of the, the earliest civilizations that were writing, the Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations, uh, had papyrus that had recordings of dreams. So people have been interested in them forever. And the er, a lot of the early um, interpretations of dreams uh, obviously had uh, uh, third parties involved that were supernatural in one way or another, either you know a god or the gods or some shaman that are involved in these. I yes, mean, they... or, or ancestors communicating sure, sure, sure. in dreams, but that, that something beyond oneself well, was bringing One dreams. can understand that, considering the bizarre nature of what mm -hmm. it, how, how different it is from the, the waking experience. Yes, or the, the, the other thing that some ancient societies believed, uh, it, sometimes in combination with the, the religious beliefs, was that, that they were traveling in some other reality mm -hmm. or plane, that, mm -hmm. that dream experiences were real and that mm -hmm. their self had been plucked out <laughs> of one world into another, yeah. which, again, is very easy to understand right. in terms of right. the subjective in, in, experience. In, in one way, that's sort of true. Yeah, there are still people around who believe oh, no, that. that, that yes. I mean, they believe in a literal <laughs> sense, but yes. even in a figurative mm -hmm. sense, uh, we are plucked out of the real world and put into this mm -hmm. this uh, new world. Yeah, that that's certainly in. the way we experience it. Right. So to take that very literally was, right. was a Okay, so that, that's sort of the ancient history. And, and what about in more, uh, as the Enlightenment occurred, or the philosophers uh, before, the, maybe, before Freud? I mean, what what... How, how did dreams uh, develop? Well, in in the West, that sort of they come from outside ourselves seemed to drop out pretty much with the, the some of the philosophers who were the precursors to Freud in writing about the unconscious and mm -hmm. and the idea that we had motivations and beliefs and impulses that that we weren't consciously aware of. They began to see dreams as a as a major outlet of that. At, at, a, at a somewhat earlier period, the East was shifting toward a philosophy of sort of seeing them as a useful model to think about waking experience. I mean, in in Buddhist and Bon and yogic and Hindu traditions, you get a lot of this um, talk about how dreams demonstrate the illusory nature of uh of our experience, but basically the idea that if you're the Chang Su, you know, was dreaming of being a butterfly and woke up mm -hmm. and asks, you know, am I right. now Chang right. Su dreaming of being, just dreamt of being a butterfly or a butterfly now dreaming of being <laughs> Chang Su. Um, th that, that permeates a number of different sort of Eastern things. That idea that, um, it's illuminating something very real that our internal experience of things doesn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence with objects out there. Even even when we are seeing the sensory world, it's being very mediated through our brain's processes. But but a lot of the Eastern philosophy of that time started sort of saying, well, if dreams are illusory, it can vanish. That sort of shows that reality is so illusory. So it's using dreams as a... Uh a marker, in a mm -hmm. sense, of a, of a deeper reality, mm -hmm. not the imposition in our minds by a by a god, but our minds sort of going out and getting a sense of what the cosmic consciousness reality is all about. It's kind of the, yeah. So those were the interesting okay. developments in then, very different parts now, of the world. Now comes Freud. It comes Freud, who really basically is just building on a lot of European philosophy traditions about the unconscious, um, but but. What was really distinctive to him was to apply it to some very seriously 
emotionally disturbed people rather than mm -hmm. mainly in talking about normal processes to use the unconscious as an explanation for okay. most of psychopathology. Uh, but he certainly elaborated um, dreams in terms of the unconscious, but he shifted them very much toward an emphasis on the psychopathology, whereas some of the earlier philosophers of the unconscious had si simply in a normal sense. Certainly that put a focus on dreams, and, mm -hmm. and he gave it a lot of uh, publicity, shall we mm -hmm. say. Uh, and then as the 20th century developed, and science developed, and the biology of, of dreams developed, and other, uh, other uh, 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 psychological uh, traditions criticized Freud. So, so what happened by the, you know, up until the current time? How has science now come into that after Freud? Well, I think for a while in psychiatry and psychology, dreams were sort of looked negatively at because they were so associated with the Freudian yeah. ideas mm -hmm. of, of there being about these sort of primitive, childlike, unconscious things that that was not taken very seriously, but but if you thought about dreams, that that was what was associated with thinking about dreams. So there was a big period of not a lot of, of dream research, or the people that did the most research were more the cultural psychologists who were looking at things like who dreams what sort of content, mm -hmm. not so much about what they mean or what they're for, as just categorizing the phenomena. And um, and a lot of the content analysis is is kind of just things about, are the dreams set indoors or outdoors? Do they have animals in them? If so, are they domestic or wild animals? How much aggression versus friendliness? Mm -hmm. uh, turns out the average dream is kind of the negative side of neutral and mm -hmm. emotional tone. Mm -hmm. um, Women dream about men and women about equally. Men dream about men much more than they dream about women across <laughs> most cultures. Right. It just sort of that sort of cataloging was very popular in the 50s, 60s, 70s when the Freudian stuff was kind of out and before some of the biological research on dreams. Then came the biology. Yes. And that really has led to a, a really a, an explosion of, uh, yes. of research. I think that the very first things in the 50s, the discovery of rapid eye movement sleep, that dreams were occurring then, almost kind of dampened dream research more for it. was It, it was amazing how many theories sort of said, oh, we've discovered what the brain is doing during dreams, therefore they don't mean anything. Um, really, that's the core of several of those yeah. biological theories. If, mm -hmm. if, the, if you can see what the brain's doing during a dream, <laughs> then it's meaningless, which you'd never say about waking thought. We yeah. can map this on to what the brain is doing. We well, the brain has to be doing it. wouldn't be thinking. To, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so it seemed almost at first, I think, because of some of the people doing the neurological research kind of saying this is this is what our findings and their findings about what the brain was doing were very solid but they're kind of therefore dreams are random and meaningless wasn't particularly so there was a little maybe even dip in mm -hmm. interest in mm -hmm. dreams subjectively but then gradually that we knew what the brain was doing and it was pretty interesting and pretty different from awake and yet did map pretty well onto the characteristics of of dream experience. Um, the frontal areas being less active when we're exercising, less logic makes sense, that the visual cortex is very active, but it's actually the areas that have to do more with imaging than with actual processing mm -hmm. of input. Mm -hmm. I mean, lots of the findings are not surprising, but it's interesting to be able to, to see them. So it's really a fascinating uh, historical arc, if you think mm -hmm. about it, over human history in terms of an understanding of what dreams are. Mm -hmm. So what do you look to the future? Um, well, certainly I think brain neuroscience is going to get more and more detailed in what, what we can do. Um, the the discovery of lucid dreams and that they were really happening in rapid eye movement sleep. Lucid able, dreams meaning when you know you're dreaming. Yeah, when you know you're dreaming. And usually having somewhat more control over the dreams is is a very active area of dream research right now. And um, do, you, right, do you lucid dream? Yes, yes. And I, I spontaneously do a little, but I definitely do more when I'm doing what we call dream incubation and sort of intentionally trying to at bedtime. And right now, that sort of bedtime intention, which I've done a lot of research on, is the 
best way to influence dreams. But I've already heard people speculating. There are all sorts of little ways of magnetically stimulating mm -hmm. a particular brain area or putting a small electrical current through yeah. it to activate it more, damp it down. And everyone's kind of going, oh, well, if you woke the prefrontal cortex up during REM sleep, you would probably have someone lucid, wouldn't you? Yeah. So I think there's going to be all kinds of fiddling with manipulating electromagnetic states as well as just mapping them in the future.